a free and open India Pacific with a single place. Shinzo Abe changed the America's view of Asia and China. Seoul, South Korea, CNN. To many in Asia Pacific, Shinzo Abe was president. Prescient in recognizing the challenge of rising China poses to the America lead system of political and military alliances, and the former Japanese Prime Minister killed by the assassin's bullet on July 8, argu arguably did more than any of his Western contemporaries to meet that challenge. Abe, who served two separate and was Japan's longest serving prime minister will be remembered by many as the leader who finally led the country out of the shadow of World War II. He foresee, foresaw that the rapid growth of China's People's Re Revelation Army, fueled by one of the world's fastest growing economies, would upset the regional balance of power and argued Japan would, as a, as a result of this shift, have to rethink its post-war U.S.-imposed pacifist, pacifist constitution. In 2014, Abe's government reinterpreted that constitution to enable the Japanese military to their theoretically fight overseas, and he gave it the tools to do so, buying, buying steel the fighters and building Japan's first aircraft carriers since World War II to accommodate them. But perhaps his biggest con con contribution to the defense of his country and to many the secretary of the wider Asia region lies not in military equipment, but in language, in his coining of the simple phrase, a free and open in the Pacific. Paradigm shift. With those few words, Abe transformed the way many foreign policy leaders talk and think about Asia. Today, much to the annoyance, of China's leaders that praise is everywhere. It's used like a mantra by the US military and is the vocabulary of a choice for any aspiring Western diplomat. So it can be hard to remember that before Abe, a few people in these circles talked of the Indo-Pacific at all. Before 2007, the preference in Washington was to conceptualize Asia as that great stretch of the globe spanning from Australia to China to the United States and to refer to it as the Asia Pacific. This concept has China at its center, a set anathema for Abe who, like many Japanese, feared Beijing's growing clout meant his country could be bullied by a far larger neighbor. Abe's aim was to encourage the world to view Asia through a far, a far wider lens, that of the Indo-Pacific, a concept spanning spanning both the Indian and the Pacific Oceans that he first promoted in the 2007 speech to the Indian Parliament titled The Confluence of the Two Seas. This rethinking of Asia's boundaries did two things. Firstly, it shifted the geo geographical center to Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the South China Sea. Conventional conveniently focusing minds on the area of the world where Beijing has a territorial dispute with a string of nations. Secondary, the perhaps more importantly, it brought into the picture the one country in the world that could act as the counter counterweight to China through its sheer size alone, India, Japan's helicopter carrier, the Huga, at the Pierre 
in Yokohama in 2009, bringing India into the fold. Abe recognized India's importance as the diplom democratic balancer to future Chinese hegemony and began systemically wooing, wooing Indian leaders to the flame, framing, wrote John Hemmings of the East-West Center in Washington in the 2020 20 evaluation of Abe that coincided with the end of his second stint as Prime Minister. Including a democratic India in the future of Asia was not only good geopolitics, it was a good geoeconomics as India's population and the democratic system balanced out China's equally large population and authoritarian system. Abe became a driving force behind the quadri quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or Quad, which brought India into a par partnership with Japan, the US, and Australia that launched the same year as his confluence of the two seas speech. The partnership has its root, root in relief apple to for the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami, but it gained an ideological component in the 2006 campaign speech by Abe, according to the Center for Strategy and International Studies. It was then reborn in 2007 as a strategic forum featuring semi-regular summit information exchanges and, uh, crucially, joint military drills that have met the pushback from China. Months later, Abe outlined his vision of the broader Asia, an immense network spanning countries that share fundamental values such as freedom and democracy and the common strategic interest. That description appears to leave little room for China which has felt threatened by the Quad ever since, and whose foreign minister Wang Wei has openly accused the U.S. of trying to encircle China with an Indo-Pacific NATO. Shinzo Abe means Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on the banks of the river Gang Ganges at Baran Baranasi. December 2015, a free and open in the Pacific. When for a while it appears that China's hostility might scooper the Quad, which fell apart in 2008 following threat of economic retaliation by Beijing, Abe played his hands once again. According to Japan's Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Abe first outlined his vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific at the keynote speech in Kenya in 2016. His vision consisted of three pillars, the promotion and establishment of the rule of law, freedom of navigation and free trade, the pursuit of economic prosperity, and the commitment to peace and stability. The thumb acted as a foil for Beijing's increasingly China-centric vision of China Asia's future, future, while promoting openness and values to attract regional hackers, said Hemings of the East-West Center. The year after Abe Kenya speech, the Quad was reborn, and the Trump administration unveiled its own concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific. By the time of Abe's death, the Quad had expanded significantly. In the past two years, the four countries have held two joint naval exercises, convening around the mantra of promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific. Abe's legacy. Writing after Abe's death, Robert Wald, Japan chair of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, noted how Abe had reconstructed his country's foreign policy 
driven by his quick recognition of the threat to Japan and the regional order from China's rapid rise. As, as such, Ward wrote, it was hard to overstate the transformational importance of the, his legacy, both the inside and outside Japan. The breadth of Abe's influence is clear from the tribute that followed his death. Among the statesmen paying his respect was Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who has referred to Abe as the dear friend since meeting him in 2007 and declared last Saturday a day of national mourning in India for a former Japanese leader. Telling too were the tribute for the U.S., China's biggest rival and Japan's biggest military ally. Under Abe, ties between the U.S. and Japan had reached a new level, said Tobias Harris, senior fellow for Asia at the Center for American Progress, and this was reflected in President Joe Biden's order that U.S. flags be flown at half a step at all public buildings in the country and all federal facilities around the world. It was also reflected in the White House official tribute. Abe was a fa faithful friend to the United States, the White House said. He worked with the American president of both the parties to deepen the alliance between our nations and advance a common vision for a free and open in the Pacific. Joe Biden met Shinzo Abe in New York City in 2014. Words of remembrance. There's that line again, a free and open in the Pacific. The phrase has become ubiquitous in U.S. policy and the military statement. While in 2018, the Pentagon's Pacific Command headquarters in Hawaii changed its name to Indo-Pacific Command to recognize the increasing connectivity between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans as America focuses the West. In the speech titled A Free and Open Indo-Pacific in Indonesia last December, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Washington would work with our allies and partners to defend the rules-based order that we've built together over decades to ensure the region remains open and accessible. Then, at the Shangri-La, Sangalira dialogue in Singapore the last month, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin used the term rules-based order or variant eight times. Japan Prime Minister Kishida used the term 19 times as he explained Japan's promotion of a free and open in the Pacific region that had come to gain broad support in the national community. That broad support may be Abe's most enduring legacy, a tribute in his own way, each own way to the region Abe had hinted at eight years earlier in his own speech to the Shangri-La Dialogue. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken gave the speech titled oh, Free and Often in the Pacific in Jakarta Indonesia in December 2021, telling his audience Tokyo was ready to take the lead in making the region prosperous for all. Abe had called on all countries to observe international law so that future generations could share in his bounty. If you imagine how vast the Pacific and Indian oceans are, our potential is exactly like the oceans, Abe said, limitless, isn't it?